causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. We are moving very, very quickly into an age when uh, nothing will be touchy-feely. It'll be done by computer. To automatically capture and verify an individual at point of sale has long been the dream of many. It'll be done so that you can extract information off people's bodies, and it'll be done for very good, uh, very practical reasons, for security, for uh, protection of an individual's identity, and so on. It took some 20 years for the computer to come into general use by our citizenry. It took about five years for the facts. And I suspect that some of these newer devices are going to take even shorter time. Prophecy Research Complex, here are Peter and Paul Lalonde. Hello, I'm Paul Lalonde, and welcome to this special update on the Mark of the Beast. As you probably know, this ministry has established itself as the leading authority in documenting the way in which modern technologies make the fulfillment of this prophecy possible. We subscribe to every leading electronic banking newsletter. We regularly meet with many of the people responsible for the efforts to build the necessary global infrastructure. And of course, we attend most of the seminars and trade shows. And in the next 90 minutes or so, we're going to examine the movement towards a cashless society. We're going to look at the smart card and the many different types of personal identification systems that can, according to planners, make the system secure. You're going to see demonstrations of electronic fingerprint readers, hand scan machines, and even the microchips that are already being implanted under the skin of animals all over the world. We're going to look at the size and power of government databases and the threats they pose to freedom and liberty. We're going to talk about smart highways, highways that can track the location of every vehicle and driver at a moment's notice. We'll discuss the way in which planners hope to merge these developments with the current drive towards a new world order. And finally, we'll take a very close look at what will ultimately turn all of these leading edge technologies into the mark of the beast. You know, but if we have any hope of achieving any of these lofty objectives in the next 90 minutes or so, Paul, we'd better get right to work. When we really first began to study the movement toward a cashless world in the late 70s, it was clear that while the technology was quickly coming online, the greatest challenge for the builders of the electronic age lay in getting people to accept such a system. Since that time, the technology has exploded, and people are becoming more and more open to the idea of electronic banking. Teller machines are very convenient, and it only takes minutes to use them, and you'll be out of there as soon as possible. You could just bring the card with you, so it's much easier. With automated tellers, I don't have to spend the time in the bank, because I usually do my banking in the evenings. Actually, automated teller machines, personally, because I bank at like 7.30 in the morning or in the evening or whenever I want to. Plus, there's no usually no lineups. I almost entirely use banking machines only. I generally use automated teller machines because I find them convenient. I find them, they're, they're not moody. But, so they're easy to use and they're much more convenient for me. And while the rush to electronic services grows, there's no question that cash is the last great dinosaur of a bygone era. Paul Schantz is a senior manager with one of Canada's big five national banks. There's no question, I'm a banker, and it used to be that we were in a very cash-driven society, a very paper-oriented society. Today, anybody will tell you, anybody that uh, is in business will tell you that not only are credit cards inefficient, paper's inefficient, anything that moves physically is inefficient. What's on the horizon? To answer that question, This Week in Bible Prophecy interviewed dozens of experts and even sent a, sent a research team to Washington, D.C. to attend the 1993 Card Tech Secure Tech Conference, organized under the telling theme, Solutions for the Global Frontier. The conference gathered bankers, card developers, biometric engineers, and computer experts from all over the world. All agreed, cash as we know it is old news. Henry Dreyfus is the president of Dreyfus Associates and a founder of the Smart Card Industry Association. He spoke to us about the newest product that is about to take this country and the world by storm. It is called the cash card or the prepaid card. 
Cash cards are a replacement for cash. If you think of a thousand-year-old technology, which are dollar bills, five-dollar bills, coins, and other forms of exchange of media, what, what we've done is looked at putting that onto a plastic or other paper-type card. The principle of a prepaid card is simple. You just go to a card dispenser and buy a card that has a set dollar value stored within it. Each time you use the card, the appropriate amount is electronically deducted from the card until no value remains. Then you simply buy a new card. Today, you can buy separate cards for just about anything, from train tickets, parking meters, telephone tolls, to buying newspapers or cans of soda. No digging for change, no coins given back to you, just a simple, clean, safe, and cash-free way to conduct your normal business day to day. We've been a society of credit. Two out of three Americans owe money on their credit cards at any one time. We're looking at prepayment becoming more and more established in this country. We're going to have 9 million prepay telephone cards. Last year, there was only about 100,000 of those. Next year, it'll be in the 20 to 30 million. The question that has often been raised about the cashless society was how were you going to deal with small transactions like buying a newspaper or paying a toll? It would appear that the simple prepaid cash card technology provides a clue. Already, the U.S. manufacturers who produce 90% of the world's parking meters have begun to switch from coin access to card access. Moreover, the conversation at the Card Tech Secure Tech conference was already focusing on how prepaid card applications for the smaller purchases could be merged with smart card technology to provide one card that could serve both purposes. David Chom is the chairman of the European Community CAFE system. CAFE stands for Conditional Access for Europe and is a cashless system that is two years away from testing. The, the scope of the project is really intended to encompass all kinds of credentials and uh, uh, everything from medical to uh, driver's license and uh, the, the whole range of sort of the idea is that everything that you have in your wallet today would be replaced by some kind of electronic form. So another name for the CAFE project is Electronic Wallet Project. We're going from a situation where today we have a whole lot of single issuer, single application cards. Okay? And the trend that we could definitely see towards the future is that we're going to be moving towards multi-application uh, cards, multi-issuer cards. Ever since we have been talking about uh, the cashless society, as you mentioned, you know, from the late 1970s till now, there has been no question that virtually everyone is in agreement cash has to go. Cash is a huge problem that stands uh, in the world's way of moving towards a global community right now, and there's all kinds of reasons for it. Think of it if you got rid of cash. The number of robberies and burglaries and violence that goes on out there for people to steal other people's cash. If it is a computerized society, you can't go out and steal someone's numbered bank account the same way that you could. Well, the entire black market uh, would be completely wiped out. We've talked before about the drug dealers who are running back and forth across the borders with Suitcase. big suitcases full of uh, non-sequential $20 bills. That's that right. would all be wiped out too because you can't really have it all recorded on computer. Yes, I, I gave Juan Gonzalez $30 million exactly. uh, and received nothing in return. That's right, Juan Gonzalez. <laughs> um, the other interesting thing here is that by getting rid of cash, you also do something else people can't cheat on their income taxes anymore. And this is a major point, because all of the money that goes in and out of your personal account, the only money you have access to, is going to be digitally recorded, so therefore your tax return can be checked at any time. The U.S. government is talking in terms of saving billions and billions of dollars to go towards this technology. And in a day where deficits are so great that nation states stand on the brink of collapse, in a day when cash money, you know, we've already heard the quote that anything that is handled physically now um, is out of mode with the times. It's out of the way of the times in which we live in now. You need things to be done electronically and immediately, and there is no way for this kind of cheating. You know, something else we mentioned, Paul, and this is something we have observed over the years, the technology has been largely in place for a number of years. Now, I want to talk about the smart card more in this program. I want to talk about cash cards because technology is evolving. It's not that we have the same technology we had in the 70s. We have superior technology. But the problem is not with the technology because technology only evolves as quickly as money is funneled into it. And if the people who are working on developing the system, bankers and so on, don't see that there is acceptance for their system, they're not going to be pumping in as much money to try to bring the system along as quickly as they otherwise. So the technology could have come along more quickly than it has. What has held us up are attitudes. 
when automated teller machines first showed up in the early 80s, the late 70s, and began to be in, you know, subway stops, and you would mm -hmm. see them on telephone poles and outside the branch uh, of the bank that you would deal with, you could notice an amazing trend that if you stood in your bank branch where they had both the human teller and the automated teller machine, it would be all of the younger folks lined up at the automated teller machine. They're used to dealing with computers now and so on. And all the old people, you know, 35, 40 years old, they're not used to a new system like this. Um, they were tending towards more towards the human teller. Now in the last 10 years, all of society, first of all, you've had 10 or 15 years for the society to age. The people who are comfortable with computers and machines now make up a larger point uh, percentage of the population. So you can see definitely a change in attitude now that people are very open to this kind of technology. In fact, one of the things we're going to talk about in a few minutes is we were amazed just how open people were to it. There's no fear whatsoever of the kind of data that can be gained and so on. Well, that's right. I remember uh, interviewing people uh, for the first Mark of the Beast video outside of uh, Bank Teller and uh, an ATM machine uh, in Niagara Falls. And we were seeing that exact trend. The, the older people were coming up and saying, you know, I like to deal with a human, I don't trust these machines. And then you'd talk to young people, 17, 18, 19, even 20 years old, who had never been inside a bank. That's they, right. they deal strictly with the Johnny Cash machine, I think they're called, outside the, the bank. In Canada here, that's right. And so when you see these people, the one advantage that the, the purveyors of this system have is it's the old people who oppose it, meaning the people who oppose it are dying off. And that's just... Uh, <laughs> to put it very, very <laughs> bluntly. To put it bluntly, it's, it's, uh, it's not nice to think about, but it is none, nonetheless reality that the people who oppose it are dying off and the people who favor it are just are now becoming Coming the bulk in. of the population. That's right, that's right. Um, it was interesting, uh, the, the one fellow who said, you know, I like an automated teller machine, they never get moody at you, and it's uh, <laughs> sort of true. Now, another thing that we've just pointed out, and something I'd like to stress before we really get rolling along on this video, because we still have so much to cover. It's quite exciting, actually. One of the questions we always had, my wife Patty, who does a lot of the research on uh, these topics, the background and so on, the thing that was the perceptual problem to this system was the fact that you're telling me you're going to set up automated teller machines uh, everywhere so there'd be no cash at all? In a phone booth? Yeah, in a phone booth. You're going to have to put your credit card in, have it hook up with some central database somewhere that's going to take the 75 cents out of your account, move it over to the account of the phone company. You're going to spend all that money. It doesn't make sense. You've got buses. You've got parking meters. You've got, what if you go in to buy some candy in the store? Or you just want to grab a pop? You're going to try to access a central database It'll, it'll end up that. costing you a dollar to move 75 cents. Exactly. And so this was, how are you going to build a system that can cope with this? And this was one of the logical explanations. But I think you've heard a little bit of what the plan is here now. It's the concept of the cash card. And one of the quotes you just heard in that piece that Paul did was one of the fellows talking about the fact that they're going to merge the smart card technology, which allows you to do your big banking purchases, and the cash card, which it would mean, say you had, you got down to one card, because this is what we we're talking about, uh, uh, David Chom talking about the fact the electronic wallet, one card that does everything. When you get down to that card, it will possibly have two parts. It will have your smart card chip, that will allow you to do your transactions with the database out there, if you will, if you're going to buy a car or a house or something like that. But there'll also be a place on that card where you can go in and put it into a machine and have, say, $50 put on it in value. Then you can use that card everywhere, and there's no access to a database. It's just subtracting the money off the card. Now, we haven't seen a lot of these cash cards here in America yet, but they're coming. We were just in Israel, That's and we right. had to make some phone calls. And uh, we went to the machine, and there was no place to put any coins in it. So we went to our guide uh, who traveled with us, and she gave us her cash card. And all it is is a telephone, Israeli telephone card, that you put in the pay phone. And each time you make a local phone call on the thing, it starts out that you have 50 calls. And you buy the card, and you pay the fee for 50 calls. And then when you're done, your card now has had one electronically subtracted off it. So when you put the card in the next time, it says you only have 49 calls left to do. As you can see, no regular access to a central database for small transactions that would clog the whole system down, the innovation is coming a long way along, and the desire is to get rid of cash altogether because it's a dinosaur in an electronic age. Well, you know, I saw a commercial on television just last week for something called NICE, which was N-Y-S-E. I, I always thought that was New York Stock Exchange. I'm sure that's not what it stands for. I never did figure out what it was. Anyway, you can get these cards, these NYSE cards, that you take to this supermarket in New York State, and it is an actual debit card. You have this card, you take it in, you give it to the cashier, they run up your grocery bill, put in the card, and it automatically takes the money out of your bank account. 
Now, I just saw this myself a week ago, so maybe this, uh, this ad has been running for a while and I just haven't well, seen that channel, but... There are tests running all over North America now, in Canada and the United States, mm -hmm. actual debit card system. And just to explain very briefly, a debit card system, you use it just like your credit card, except that machine is electronically hooked up to your bank. And so the minute you give them that card, it electronically goes into your bank account and moves it into the store's bank account. It's the wave of the future, and it's where we're going. Let me just say, this video that you're watching is a sequel to our a blockbuster video, really, from a few years ago, called Mark of the Beast. And so we went into all the details of how the cashless society uh, worked there, so it might be a good idea to watch that in conjunction with this, because there is overlap in the two areas, but really these are completely different things that we're talking about That's right, and setting our focus on. There's no question that the greatest obstacle to electronic banking systems today is security. The fact of the matter is that card fraud is literally out of control. The UK card industry is suffering from heavy card fraud. Fraud in the UK is quite a major business. Bob Carter is the president of Orchard International and an expert in biometric technology. It's got to the situation where government ministers are talking about it, the media are talking about it, and even the newspapers are talking about it. But according to Robert Townend of Barclays Bank in the UK, Britain is not the only nation facing this crisis. Fraud has often been cited as a, a business reason to look at a new technology. It's not just in the UK or Singapore, uh, but it's a global problem, uh, card fraud. Uh, what we see is smart cards as one tool that has been examined. Just what is a smart card? And what is it that makes it smart? And how does it differ from other types of plastic cards? Basically, there are three kinds of technologies. There's a magnetic card, which is like our credit card. We have optical or laser cards, which are used in telephones, such as in the United Kingdom. And integrated circuit or smart cards, which are cards that have a brain inside them. The basic difference among these competing technologies has to do with the amount of data that they can store. And in today's information age, more is always better. That's why the smart card is the hands-on favorite for becoming the dominant technology in the days ahead. Now smart cards are actual small microcomputers with operating systems, development language, interchange commands, and even having their own databases inside them. But what can all this power do? How can it help to prevent against the rampant card fraud we've just examined? Well, the answer is twofold. First, the microchip that is contained in the card is virtually counterfeit proof and it's almost impossible to access for computer hackers. In fact, in France, where almost 100% of the bank cards are now smart cards, a recent report shows a 22% drop in bank card fraud. Compare this to Visa and MasterCard, who report continually growing losses, and who now reveal that they lost $1 billion in card fraud in 1991 alone. But even this does not do justice to the true power of the smart card. That power is found in the card's ability to positively link the card to its owner. In other words, to make sure the person using the card is the rightful owner of that card. Today's personal identification number-based system is woefully inadequate. It simply requires the cardholder to punch in a secret code when using his or her card. The problem with this system is that it fails to take into account the aged and mentally handicapped who can't remember their numbers. It doesn't protect against a criminal who steals the card and demands to be told the number. And most importantly, it does not protect against human carelessness. A Federal Reserve study done several years ago found that the majority of people actually wrote their PIN numbers right on the card, so they wouldn't lose it, totally defeating the system. If we're going to go to a totally cashless society, the system must be tightened. It must be made completely foolproof, and that is where the power of the smart card comes in. Smart cards alone won't stop fraud, we know that. The response by the banks to the government even suggested in the longer term they believe that biometrics offered the only real solution. If you can do a biometric comparison in the card, that's something that uh, you know, has tremendous amount of value. Uh, you can have a true possession-based handshake to the card. We're talking about the fact that the smart card's great power lies in the ability for a system to be developed where you can, that card can tell you, I am the card of this man who is standing here. Now, we're going to talk about how that's going to happen in a few minutes. It's through something that is known as biometrics. Comparing who you are as a human being, some physical characteristic, whether it's a fingerprint or an eye scan or a hand scan, that is done 
you do that, you put in your hand for a hand scan, for example, the card stores it and remembers that, so the next time you go to use your card, you have to put your hand in again, and it compares the two. So it makes sure that someone has not stolen your card. So this is the power of a smart card, that it has the storage capability to do this. But as we said in the report, in an electronic age, in an information society, information is king. More is always better. And the fact of the matter is, these smart cards can store a phenomenal amount of information. Well, and what they're trying to do is work on, on methods of biometrics, and we'll get into this later, that use less storage capacity. Storing uh, a fingerprint, for example, takes a, um, lot more. takes a lot more than, say, storing the shape of your hand. But they are definitely, uh, the, the trend in, in technology today is definitely moving toward biometrics, because those are the simplest ways of identifying people electronically, because a biometric is, uh, is from the root bio, meaning body, and metric, meaning uh, to measure, <laughs> meaning metric, yeah. <laughs> so biometric means that they're measuring something on the body. Right. And that's one of the things we've talked about. Well, uh, and we're going to have some actually some displays of this in just a few minutes. But the thing I want to sort of jump ahead of ourselves here a bit, if I can, we mentioned that there are three kinds of technology that are being really observed today. There is the magnetic strip, which is like the back you see on your credit card. There's a black right. magnetic strip there. They can't store very much information, so it's sort of the technology of the day gone by. There's not really a lot of room to store, other than a few account numbers and so on. There's just not the data storage capacity. Then there's the optical card, which the storage area is really the whole uh, body of the card. It's a, right. an optical laser beam red card. But then there's the smart card, which has this microchip in it, and we've already heard it's a miniature computer right in there storing all kinds of data. Well, the microchip is really the breakthrough, and when we get to microchip, that's from uh, the root micro, meaning small, and chip, meaning little plastic thing. <laughs> and when you look at these microchips, these are incredibly small. They're like the lead off a pencil. We'll look at those in a few And minutes. yet their that's data right. storage uh, capacity is absolutely astronomical, the amount of data they can stuff into these things. And the thing is that Every passing day, they seem to be able to stuff a little bit more into a smaller and smaller space. So probably sure. by the time we have smart cards in everybody's wallet, which could be very soon, uh, these things will hold even far more than we're going to discuss that they do now. A great amount of data. You'll remember that one of the personal computers that first came out when PCs became the big thing was the Commodore 64. <laughs> and of course, the 64 referred to the amount of memory that it had, right. correct? The processing power That's of right. the machine. 64K. The next step they're talking about in smart cards is 64K smart card. So now you've got a little card this big that can do more than the PCs that just came out. You know, they call PCs that came out at that generation the world's youngest antique. And it's That's really right. true. They have no value today because the technology has come along so far. And smart cards, when you start to think about the idea of them implementing these on a global level, which is what they're talking about doing right now, uh, when that kind of research and development goes into it, it'll be unbelievable what can be done on these cards. Let's also remember, I'll just give you a little foretaste here. This is a Bible prophecy video, not just a banking video. <laughs> and the scripture says that the Antichrist receiveth all to receive a mark Cause in the their right. Okay, I'm sorry to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Now, we don't want to get into the semantics too much here, but the fact of the matter is that chip on the smart card is the only thing that's of value on that card. That piece of plastic that that chip is glued to is just a handy carrying case. You could take that chip right out of the card, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we get going here. And something we've talked about a little bit, too, is the need to make people comfortable and to make this transition so that people are comfortable. That's why it's a card and not some other. Maybe, maybe there would be some other more convenient thing, have it, have it stored in a pen or a pencil or something like that. The fact that they've got it stored in a card is to help people be more comfortable. Become Acclimated. Because they're already used to having cards. It, it, I mean, look at all the years it took to get people comfortable with credit cards. And for a long time, nobody even wanted to have a credit card. Now they're talking about, I don't know, the average American has his credit card right up to the limit or something. Yeah, two I, out of three. That's right. So what they're doing is trying to make this comfortable and make the transition as smooth as possible. It's phenomenal, but definitely the thing to keep the eye on, uh, the, the horse to bet on here, if you will, is the smart card. This is where the technology is going. When we attended um, this conference, let me take a second and go on about this conference for a second, because you're about to see some clips from it. It was called Solutions for the Global Frontier. And this week in Bible Prophecy felt that because it was our mission, we don't want to just be a Bible prophecy teacher. There are many good teachers, but we want to be a documenter. We believe God has called us to be a documenter of what is taking place in this generation. So you can sit down and say, there it is happening right there in front of my eyes. Here's what the Bible says. 
So we sent the crews down to Washington, D.C., and the clips you have seen already in this production, the clips you're going to see upcoming, several of them are from that conference. And the feeling you are going to get from these people is cash is gone, the smart card is coming, and we need to somehow link those transactions to the individual characteristics of a person, biometrics like we're talking about. Watch these very carefully because these are not Bible prophecy people talking to you. These are the leaders in the banking industry. Biometrics, according to researchers, is a technology whose time has come by making sure that we check a person's identity by physical characteristics which cannot be changed. Instead of simply accepting some form of paper ID, we can, according to industry insiders, virtually eliminate fraud and access to restricted areas. And make no mistake about it, in an information society with billions of dollars only a few keystrokes away, biometrics are here to stay. Although biometrics have been researched for many, many years, it is only latterly that the industry has received much encouragement. This year, for example, we have seen a mass use of the fingerprint technology at the Expo 92 in Seville. It proved that fingerprint technology can be used by people and is willingly to be, willing to be used by people. In the United States, a consortium of over 60 government agencies has just been formed to look into biometric technologies. The Biometric Authentication Consortium is intended to serve as a government focal point for research, development, test, evaluation, and application of biometric-based personal identification and authentication technologies. Jerry Webster of the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service says, however, that even as large as a 60-agency effort is, this is still something much larger. But we're looking new technology. In fact, the U.S., Canada, Britain, Australia have a task of putting together a new technologies paper for our next meeting in Montreal in July. Uh, some of the things we have in there are the broader use of biometrics. And do we share, how much do we share these biometrics internationally? Let's take a few moments now to look at some of the biometric systems being used to verify the identity of people. To do that, here is our This Week in Bible Prophecy reporter, Sue Rogers, on the floor of the Card Tech Secure Tech Conference in Washington, D.C. We're speaking with Bill Allsbrooks from Information Spectrum, Inc., and he is going to explain to us some of the applications of verifying ID in moderate to high security systems. Right. Okay, what we have here is a system that we use a fingerprint as a personal identification number, and we put that fingerprint on a, an integrated circuit chip card, so-called smart card. Uh, then we can use that then to verify uh, positive ID or to allow entrance into the moderate or high security areas. So the way we would do this is to enroll you. And I would ask you to put your fingerprint on the device here. Okay, and when I do this, I now am taking three pictures of your finger with a charge couple device camera. It will then do a mathematical transformation on that. You will see it is successful. If you'll leave your finger there, we'll verify that. It has done that. At this point in time, we would take your photo. And now at this point in time, I am writing the fingerprint to the smart card. I am writing the picture, the fingerprint template, and the information that I recorded about you out onto this erasable optical drive. It's a 128 megabyte optical, erasable optical drive. Now I have done that. Now let's say I want to verify who you are. I'll ask you to put your finger back on there It is reading your fingerprint back off of the smart card. It is now verifying it has accepted you. I can now display the photograph that was taken of you that uh, was done at that time. So it is about a six second to enroll. It is a one to two second to verify or to reject you. However, as secure as this system may seem to be, there are a couple of potential problems that could arise if this technology were to be used on a wide scale. For example, people of oriental backgrounds do not have good, well-defined fingerprints. 
Pipe smokers have all but obliterated theirs. Hand cream gums up the optical readers, and manual workers rub their prints right off. But there is still another concern. The difficulty, perhaps, with fingerprints is because it's become accepted as de-verification technology to prove beyond all shadow of a doubt that somebody was at a scene of a crime, an overturn of criminality has entered into the world of fingerprinting. Thus, another technology is gaining ground on the fingerprint. It is the hand geometry reader. Let's go back to Sue for a look at that. Okay, and here we have the hand geometry biometrics. Could you explain that to us? Well, what this do does, again, you have a charge couple device camera in here that takes uh, a three-dimensional shot of your hand, and from your hand, it computes a numerical template similar to what we did over here. But in this case, instead of having a 300-byte template, we have a nine-byte template, which allows you to put it on cards like immigration cards. It, you can put it here in an OCR font. Uh, what we've done with you prior to this was to enroll you so your hand geometry template is already on this card so that if I swipe it through this MagStripe reader, I will ask you to put your hand in here and you will see it says user authorized, which would allow you, again, positive ID and access control to a moderate to uh, reasonably secure area. Hand geometry technology was first developed at Stanford Research Institute in 1971, and along with fingerprint biometrics, it is on the verge of widespread acceptance. We also have seen the mass use of fingerprint and hand geometry technology throughout the world. And perhaps the most significant thing for the main biometric application which everyone says will take place is that the financial institutions for the first time ever issued their specification for what they would require should a biometric ever be used for real. However, as is the case in a developing industry, fingerprint readers and hand scan machines are far from the only products being developed. Recent Hollywood movies have begun to introduce the public to all the latest designs. Perhaps the one which always intrigues me is the, the blood vessel patterns at the back of the eye. This is where we are required to look through binocular style lenses and concentrate on a small little dot. And then while we're concentrating, a low intensity infrared light is shone into our eyes. But from an application point of view, I can't see uh, many people being willing to um, shine their eyes into an infrared light. I'm speaking with Rod Beetson of Electronic Signatures Incorporated, and he's going to explain to us, and we're going to do a demonstration on applications of this technology. Thank you. What we have here is a signature capture and verification device uh, called Sinon, and it's for use at point of sale or point of transaction in a bank or at a large retailer store where the uh, transaction will be undertaken by using a credit card, or in this case, a smart card. Um, the uh, uh, customer comes up to the cash wrap with the uh, dress or suit that he's bought or she's bought and pays for the transaction using a smart card. The smart card is inserted in the device and the customer then signs for the transaction. At the same time as the transaction is signed for, the signature is captured electronically and stored electronically by the retailer so that uh, the retailer has no uh, paperwork to consider. The customer takes the only piece of paper in the transaction away uh, with them and the signature at the same time it is submitted by the customer is also verified against the template held on the smart card. Uh, that is briefly exactly how the system works. One of the more recent uh, biometrics that has gone past the breadboard stage is vein checking. If you clench the back of your fist, you can see your veins come up. Now that's uh, on the subcutaneous part of the hand. And it's already been, uh, you know, even though it's in its infancy and a lot, of work is, a lot of work and money has been spent on it, it's already been christened the personal barcode. As dramatic and fascinating as all these technologies are, they all have one central drawback. They are simply far too expensive. 
In fact, a consortium of bankers issued a set of standards that any widely used biometric verification system would have to meet. These guidelines include an accuracy rate that allowed no more than one mistake in 100,000, a speed of less than three seconds, and a cost of less than $220 per device. Not one existing technology meets these specifications. But when you stop and think about what we have just seen there before our very eyes, it's a system that makes so much logical sense. This is one of the great things about studying the fulfillments of Bible prophecy. These aren't just weird things that are going to come on the world in the last days that there's no rationale for. These are going to seem to be the very most logical things because the scripture says that all of these things, like a snare, it will come upon the world. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. It seems like the way to go. And you look at a system like this and you say, you mean we could wipe out all drugs? Boy, you've got to admit drugs are a huge problem in our society today. You could wipe out the drug trade. You could wipe out the black market. Um, this idea of having a body part confirmed to your card, like we saw with the fingerprint reader and so on, it means that you can't um, break into the system very easily. Now, my wife is a pretty bright lady, and so when she was at the conference, she asked one of the guys there, she said, hey, what if you went out and you chopped off the finger of your victim and you put it in the machine? Hey, it's a logical question. You could still do it, right? No, the machine knows if that hand or that finger is alive or not, and it won't accept the input if it's not an alive uh, part of a body. So you would be forced, if you wanted to steal anything from anybody, you would be forced to bring them in at gunpoint or whatever to have them stick their finger in the machine if you were going to use their card. Suddenly, you're a lot more out in the open than doing something in a back alley or something like that. The system seems so very logical. Now, the problem is primarily the cost. You're going to set up one of these fingerprint readers. These things cost tens and tens of thousands of dollars. Depending on the different technologies used, you can be talking up to $100,000 for a unit on some of these things. So if you have a fingerprint reader, and look at all the problems we had with the fingerprint reader. You know, women put all this hand cream. I know my wife does it. Yeah. Has all this hand cream. Boy, you'd gum up that thing in a big hurry. And all of these other problems, along with the cost, become a problem. The hand scan machine. But you know, if you stop and think about it for a second, and we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves here, but let's just hypothesize for a second, because we're allowed to hypothesize, because all we're trying to say in this video is the technology exists today for the first time in history to fulfill this prophecy as it never has in any other generation in human history. So taking a look at this technology now, and you say you have the guy with his smart card here, but you want his fingerprint there, but all the information's in the smart card, and all the expense is in the machine to run the, read the finger, what if you took the chip out of that card and implanted it under the skin? In this age, where you can find out a machine can judge whether a finger is alive or not, you could just have it that the chip goes dead the minute it's removed from living tissue. The minute anybody tried to tamper it with it, it would be destroyed and it wouldn't work. You now have the scanner that can read the smart card, the same kind of technology that scanners can read the universal product codes on a product in your grocery store now could read that chip. So there's not an expensive technology. And the chip was the only important part in the card anyway, so you've just thrown away a piece of plastic. You now have the system that makes perfect logical sense with the technology that is there. So once again, I'm not saying that there is some mad scientist in a room somewhere <laughs> trying to figure out how to put a smart card under your skin. All we're saying is, in this generation, for the first time in history, this prophecy could be fulfilled. No other generation could have fit the match, and we're going to talk about that further on down the road, but there's no question this is the generation where it exists. You know, you're talking about the, the hypothesizing and, and talking about putting the chip. I would be very surprised if we're the only ones who ever thought of this. Of I mean, they're, they're paying these guys $400 billion a year to sit and play with their little computers. <laughs> That's a and good that, wage. <laughs> <laughs> sit and play with their little computer chips and stuff. Surely someone has thought of this thing. And so We're going this to see is, reports that they have later exactly, on Exactly. So it's not just conjecture. The other, the other point I'd like to make is the, the microchip implant under the skin would meet those criteria. That's it would be right. very fast. That's it could right. be very accurate. And yeah. it would be very, very cheap, as we're going to hear later. The other thing to take into account is they're talking about we need this, uh, this transaction system to cost $220. Imagine 10 years ago if a guy said, I need a computer that can sort millions and millions of rows of data, but I need it to cost less than $10,000.
They would have laughed at him. The kind of computer that I have sitting on my desk in my office right now... Is a uh, laptop? Yeah. Fifteen years ago, a computer that did all that would have been the size of my house. And That's probably right. cost, you know, a zillion dollars, and they, they were all liquid-cooled. Another and this kind of stuff. figure, of course. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> I make up the figures, but the facts are nonetheless, uh, <laughs> nonetheless accurate. But the fact of the matter is, the way technology is progressing, they can cross these cost barriers very, very quickly. Well, I'll give an example, and just to build on the story, you said when I worked for Ron Meyer years ago at writing for the Christian Inquirer newspaper, the computer that he had to keep track of his 100,000 name subscription list, you had to have a programmer that you would pay to come in and even type into the thing. They weren't user-friendly in those days. Uh, you, it would cost you, you know, 8.3 billion, billion dollars, <laughs> yeah, exactly, to have a guy come in and work on the system. Today, we have a database larger than that, actually, and it can be contained in the notebook that you have or the one that I have that just, we just use them to write articles now. The technology is exploding, so we have to keep that in mind, that what seems like a, a hard job today, a year from now, it's nothing just like that, and that's how fast it's moving along. In our discussion on the smart card, we noted that all of the power in that card is contained in a small computer microchip, which is basically glued to the card. Essentially, then, this means that the embossed name on the card and any pictures it may have are meaningless. All of the relevant data is contained in the chip. The card is little more than a handy carrying case. The question that arises is this. If you could take that chip from off the card and implant it under the skin, would you not have the perfect smart chip biometric identification system? Given the fact that chips could be made to shut down the minute they were removed from living tissue, it would be an almost foolproof system. Suddenly, the need for expensive hand scan machines or fingerprint readers would be alleviated. Retailers could be sure the chip you had was yours, because the chip would be under your skin. Now, this is not necessarily the way technology has to go, but given the fact that the Bible is still more up-to-date than the latest card technology conference, it is a possibility that could fit with what we know the Bible says. Remember, according to the King James Version of the Bible, everyone will be forced during the tribulation period to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead. Whatever technology is used, we know it will fit this description. But let's go back and take a quick look at some of the reasons being given for microchip implants in humans today. In fact, this would be a good time to mention the fact that if you want more detailed information on this, you should watch our 1990 video entitled The Mark of the Beast. This current video is a sequel to that original one, and much of the information we just skim by here or miss altogether is in that video. In The Mark of the Beast, we spoke to Dr. Daniel Mann. He's a surgeon from Florida who has a patent for an implantable microchip. This chip, he believes, could help locate many of the thousands of missing children. Here's an excerpt from Peter's telephone conversation with him. The implantable homing device is an answer to uh, many of the problems in tracking people and livestock uh, in all kinds of situations. And the uh, implantable homing device uh, is uh, put in a... Uh, area of the body in an area usually that is very difficult to detect. It is a, uh, an easy procedure. It does not take long time. And the homing device will allow to track these uh, people or livestock in a much easier way. The uh, person who wears the homing device can trigger it. Um, and it can also be triggered remotely. It can go into distress signal and the distress signal will uh, sound every uh, once in a while, once in 24 hours or so, and it will leave a signal where the uh, signal can be located uh, on, a, uh, on a screen uh, due to the uh, cellular towers right. by triangulation. Uh, a lot of the country is covered with cellular towers, and the same signal can be found and uh, when you have a uh, control house, control station mm -hmm. that controls these towers, they have computers there. And uh, the computer would then have a track of the signal. Helping in the search for missing children is only one of the reasons being put forward today for some means of electronic tracking and identification. Already, many nursing homes are placing bracelets on patients who have begun to lose track of their surroundings. Prison officials, their cells bulging at the seams from an ever-increasing influx of prisoners, are attaching bracelets to the ankles of some offenders and letting them stay at home. 
If they leave the house, an alarm goes off, alerting the authorities. A microchip implanted under the skin could also store critical medical data that could be accessed by medical workers in seconds instead of trying to locate a medical card or seeking out relatives. Police would be instantly able to know the real identity of arrested people, and gun shops would know for certain that the purchaser of a weapon was indeed entitled to do so. The fact is that these are very real, very sincere examples being given today for the very system that the Bible told us about 2,000 years ago. And if you think it's just Bible prophecy teachers who see these connections, listen to these words from an April, not, April 16, 1989 Gannett News Service article. Here's a simple trick. Wave your hand over a computer code scanner at the grocery store checkout counter and your bill is deducted from your checking account. The technology to accomplish this feat is already here, said Tim Willard, executive officer of the World Future Society, a Washington organization that claims 27,000 members worldwide. But Willard continues the will may not be. Just suggest something like an implant in humans and the social outcry is tremendous. There is definitely an aversion to something being implanted. It's the big brother is watching concept people would be afraid that all their thoughts and movements were being monitored. However, as we'll see a little later in this video, that fear is evaporating faster than you can say the words security and convenience. You know, I remember back, it's uh, a couple of years ago now that I spoke to Dr. Daniel Mann, and he's an Israeli, and uh, he was saying, I would like to propose to the Israeli government that we implant a chip under the skin of all of our diplomats and leading political figures and then if they get kidnapped we won't have to search around for in Lebanon for two years like the Americans had to do or five years or longer trying to search someone out because you now have tracking satellites and we're going to talk about these more in a moment that can pinpoint the location of a microchip even if you had it implanted under the skin within three feet of where it's located on the earth and as I said we're going to talk about this later but the idea of being able to track people the idea of a chip not only for financial transactions, but think of the example we used for a second of the medical community. If they rush to a scene now, someone has been hit by a car, run over by a truck or something, and the person is lying there um, on the verge of death, and they're fumbling around trying to find out what medication they can give. They look for, you know, the medic alert bag, that badge. That contains virtually no information. They dig through the wallet trying to find not all the medical information that is going to be there. They talk about, you know, some of the medical cards they're using today are optical cards. Uh, and yes, if you had a reader in the truck, you could get the card and put it through uh, the machine and there's all the medical information. But the fact of the matter is, I know how many times I go to the house, I don't have my wallet with me or I don't have a card with me. If you're out jogging, if you're out doing something, you're not going to be carrying your ID. A microchip implant, boom, they pull up to the person that is lying there, read the chip that is by definition with the body because it's a part of the body, you have instant identification. It's a very good idea for these kind of things that are taking place today. They're talking about now, you know the big lines, Paul, when we travel overseas or internationally, we're here in Canada, so every time we travel into the United States, it's a crossing a border. That's and right. in an open world today where there's so much travel, this is a time congesting, it's just a nightmare. But can you imagine, they have systems in place now that they're using smart cards, but let's go to the chip technology that you could use. The minute you pass through uh, the scanner as you walk through, it reads and makes sure that you're the person whose passport is recorded in the computer. They are using these in New York. They're using them in Denmark right now. They're being tested worldwide. One of the big developments, and I'm going on here, but one of the big developments they're talking about now are the uh, no-contact smart cards. And what that means is, leave your card in your wallet, and when you walk through, the machine will just read the card right on the seat of your pants, and you just keep walking without even knowing it's there, and it's all done. They're doing it with toll highways and so on. We'll talk about that more. But these kind of ideas of the ability to track people sound like very good ideas. It doesn't sound fearful anymore. It sounds like it's being done for your own good, to help find missing children, to help people with Alzheimer's, um, to help people in a medical emergency. Suddenly, the aura of Big Brother is gone, and it just sounds like such a very good idea. A general rule of thumb in scientific research is that if you want to see what will be a part of everyday life in the future, go see what's in the labs today. Nowhere is that truer than in the study of implantable microchips. However, the lab may be a little different than you'd expect. That's right, it's your black lab or golden lab that we're talking about here. You see, a program is now being carried out all over North America in which cats, dogs, horses, cattle, and every type of animal that you can imagine are being implanted with computer-readable microchips. 
As part of an effort to keep track of lost pets and as a way to identify livestock, InfoPet Systems of California and several other microchip developers have created a unique system that has effectively replaced the old system of dog tags and branding. The animals are implanted with a microchip that contains an electronically encoded number. That number is matched to a file and entered into a computer database. Then, if the animal runs away and is found by someone, they can simply bring it in to the local Humane Society. All the Humane Society has to do is run a scanner, no more technologically advanced than the barcode readers in your supermarket, over the skin of the animal, and a nationwide database can identify your lost pet. At last count, the system had the capability to track over 34 billion animals. Identification Devices, the Colorado-based manufacturer of the chip, however, leaves the door open to future uses. According to their promotional materials, consider how these innovations might be employed to solve the age-old problem of providing positive identification of people, animals, and equipment. So once again, it's not only the Bible prophecy teacher who sees where all of this may be leading us. Remember what Paul Schantz said at the beginning of this program? It'll be done so that you can extract information off people's bodies, and it'll be done for very good, uh, very practical reasons, for security, for uh, protection of an individual's identity, and so on. But then we went a step further and asked this man what he thought about all of this in light of the book of Revelation. So I would say yes, I think the prophecies in Revelation are quickly, quickly becoming reality as we look in the developments in the marketplace today. When we spoke to computer systems expert Randy Sestilli in our video, The Mark of the Beast, we asked him the same question. Do I think that the prophecies in Revelation are coming true? I think the technology is there. Um, that's a serious concern. Yeah, I could see it happening. You know, I hope we didn't go by it too quickly, but I want to make sure I take a second to read this quote to you again from identification devices. These are the guys developing the microchips that are being implanted under the skin of animals right now. They say, consider how these innovations, innovations in microchip technology, Consider how these innovations might be employed to solve the age-old problem of providing positive identification of people. They say it right in their own materials. Now, there's no people who are having a microchip implanted under their skin right now. It's in cats and dogs. But the point is, they see, as Paul said earlier in this tape, they see the future of this thing. They see how this thing is evolving along. And hey, it does make perfect logical sense. The European community now is saying, instead of branding our cattle, let's make it a European law that all cattle are implanted with microchips. Uh, horse breeders are doing the same thing. You know, in Western Canada, uh, where the salmon go up the Fraser River in BC, they're actually implanting some of the salmon with these microchips so they can track them and see their spawning patterns as they go upstream. So What a tremendous business opportunity that opens up to make uh, fish finders that can read those things <laughs> when you're tell everybody fishing. that that's a good idea actually <laughs> can make a lot of money on that but the technology is there to do these things and you have the databases emerging all the time on this thing you think about the fact that if you have a system in place right now that can uh, track this many different cats and dogs then you are doing a de facto test of a national database that can keep track, what was the number? 34 billion different animals. I, let me just point out for a second, when we did the, the Mark of the Beast, uh, the original Mark of the Beast video in 1990, that number was 4 billion That's right. uh, cats and dogs from InfoPet. They've now gone to 34 billion. It shows, A, how fast the technology is growing and how, how uh, the capacity has grown. And it also shows us very clearly that they now have the capacity to track every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. The technology exists is the point. And we're not suggesting that anyone is saying, hey, let's run a little test on cats and dogs here and see if we can get the system manageable for people. The fact is, they're running those tests whether they intend to or not. So we're not talking about intentions here. The fact is, the groundwork for this whole thing is being tested right now. You have the work on the smart card technology. You have the work on the electronic banking systems. You have the need to make sure that the card is attached to the person. And at the same time, you are implanting microchips under the skin of animals. And then on top of that, you're building a database that can keep track of 34 billion different cats and dogs. You're building a system that could be utilized in 
Revelation 13, a system that did not exist in any other generation before this one. And of course, people are thinking about this. People are thinking about the potential to put this uh, into human beings. As we mentioned before, obviously somebody has thought of this. Uh, I would hate to think that we gave them the idea from this video. But <laughs> no, clearly. The, no, the fact of the matter is they are thinking about it. And the other thing we had just talked about is the need for a low cost. And this does uh, solve that problem. Absolutely. There is no question that this is a system that makes perfect sense, and it has many upsides. Now, we're going to discuss in a few minutes of what the mark of the beast really is, because the mark of the beast isn't an economic decision you're going to make. It's not just about a microchip or something. It's much, much more than that. But the technology for the technological part of it is in place. Okay, say we decide, okay, I have my dog here, he keeps running away, I want to take him into the uh, Humane Society or the SPCA, as they call it in the States take him in there to get uh, to get him implanted how much is that going to cost me you know you talk about these systems that cost thousands of dollars to put that microchip under the skin of the animal thirty five dollars is your total cost of this thing so you see how cheap and economical it has really become these chips are really very inexpensive well and the chips are very small as a matter of fact I uh, I may just have a chip here as a matter of fact I have the gun what this is is the actual gun that the veterinarians use to implant the chip inside of your pet. What they do is they pinch up his skin behind his neck and then they just push it in I with this thing. Up so people can get a good shot of that here. Here, I'll hold my hand up and we'll get a good shot while you're grabbing the chip there. Okay. There is the actual gun and it's just, as you see, just a syringe needle that you just push that along and it will then push the chip under the skin of the animal. Now you have in your hand there one of those chips. Yeah, I'd like the weapon back. <laughs> Uh, what we have here is the actual, one of the actual microchips from InfoPet. And this is the exact chip that they would implant under the skin of your cat or dog. Well, this would be actually, this one here, Paul, I'm looking, is for a bit larger animal. The syringe we have actually inserts into the cats or dogs. This would be the next size up. So if you wanted to do your turtle or something like that, they <laughs> have a different big turtle to be bigger than a dog. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if you happen to have a great sea turtle at home, this is the kind of chip you'd be looking at to implant. But the fact of the matter is, you can store an incredible amount of information, not just a pet's name and address. Sure. These chips are capable of storing uh, incredible amounts of information. I can't remember how many typed pages it was, but, uh, but there was a lot. Yeah. Suffice it to say, a lot. Okay. Well, this is, I hope, showing us once again, we have talked to the bankers, because we're starting to wind up some of the technological discussion in this video now. We have talked to the bankers. We've talked to the smart card developers. We have talked to, you know, if you think of David Chom, who we talked to, who's in charge of setting up the cashless system, cash, conditional access for Europe system, which will be a cashless system to run a test within the next two years. And we have heard that all of their motivation is there. So we know that that is factual. This is not something that we're telling you. These are the actual people talking. We have shown you how the system works. We've shown you clips of the animals being inserted. We've shown you the hand scan machines and the finger scan machines. And we've now shown you the chips and the injector. This thing is really, really possible right now. Imagine a society in which every citizen is tracked, monitored, and watched. To those of us who have read George Orwell, the prospect is frightening. And as we noted in an earlier part of this video, many people have thought such a thing could never happen in America or Canada because we so carefully guard our freedoms. Well, think again. We sent our This Week in Bible Prophecy cameras out onto the streets to ask people if they were concerned about government databases and the access the government and big business had to areas that have long been considered private. Absolutely nothing else we researched for this video surprised us as much as the response we got to this question. If you also think about it, you have a Visa card or a ESO card or a whatever card. Everyone's got your address, name, phone number, and you get junk mail from all over the world. So, I mean, everyone's got the information on you, and it's hard to control that. I haven't really considered the privacy issue. Um, I guess, basically, I don't have that many secrets, so there's no real problem. It doesn't concern me too much, because I figure there's probably other ways they can get the information anyhow. So, uh, no, it doesn't concern me too much. Well, I think that uh, probably over and above the cards that you might use in the banks, uh, they have your social insurance number and they have access to a lot of information through that. So I don't really think that would be a really, uh, really strong issue for me personally. No, I don't really mind the government having um, a lot of um, information. I think it allows them to do their job a lot better. It doesn't bother me because I'm just an average Joe and they don't really care about me. Of all the people we spoke to, barely a soul was even slightly concerned. 
And make no mistake about it, if we're on to this changed mood, so are the planners of tomorrow's world. But we had a sur uh, survey recently in the UK looking at various types of biometrics and how people would react. And one of the most surprising things that came out of that for me was people would accept the fingerprint at point of sale to verify a transaction. They said it was a wee bit James Bondish, a wee bit far out, but they would still do it. Uh, we're a little freer, I guess, to be more like Big Brother in Immigration Service. I've been accused of being the forerunner of that back when we first introduced a better quality alien ID card. We too have I've been plagued sometimes by the press, by the public, with concern that that we're doing an invasion of privacy by doing biometrics. But I think, as as Bob said, the I believe that survey was in Europe or in Britain. Uh, the public has begun to more accept the use of positive identification as a benefit rather than an invasion to privacy. How would this then reflect on President Clinton's plan for a national smart health card? Whenever you propose such a dynamic new paradigm, such as using a card as an identification means for medical information, and quite confidential medical information, you run, a, you run the risk of, of introducing those types of questions and issues. But in the face of public apathy and with the pressures to come up with a cost-effective health plan, the issue may already be decided. We recently spoke with Elsbeth Minot from France's Ministry of Health. America having the, um, having the highest uh, cost uh, in health care with the lowest uh, life expect expectancy figures. Why in France uh, are we launching this uh, project, and especially the national project concerning the Vital Sesame card, which is a social security card containing administrative data only. We are viewing the reduction of administrative costs. These are really, at present, the one which can be uh, tackle, tackled the, the best. We could say that if the card would be uh, functioning in operation, we could probably save about 20 billion um, francs per year. These savings, if converted to U.S. dollars and adjusted for population size, could amount to 14,216,867,469 dollars and 89 cents, roughly, <laughs> for the United States. That's a saving that is not likely to be challenged. Another project that deserves mention is the program being run in Wyoming. In this program, welfare recipients whose children have poor nutritional uh, ratings receive their benefits via smart card. Then, when they shop at the grocery store, their purchases can be monitored. By use of the card, exact information about what exactly they bought in the store, what they are consuming, and then importantly, what they're not consuming to provide direct feedback to the caseworker. And while this once again sounds very logical and necessary, the fact is that the government is gaining more and more control in a system that the Bible says will become so powerful that the false prophet will be able to cause all to receive a mark. The beast is getting his teeth. However, the beast, it seems, is getting a new, kinder, gentler name. Where you've got an open system where you can buy a card which can be used in any body's equipment, then you need this uh, central authority, trusted centre, to uh, handle the accounting. You know, it's amazing when you talk about the idea of a government central database now being called by this gentleman a trusted center. Isn't it amazing how words are used to make people think of something? It's not a trusted center. It's a <laughs> national database in the hands of government. And any time in history when the government has had that kind of control, it gets used for the wrong purposes. Boy, you don't have to look back far in history. We're just finally getting rid of, you know, the KGB and the Soviet Union and the way they controlled all the people there during the time of that empire in China and so on. And now you have these databases being born again. And as I say, we went out onto the streets and nothing shocked me more than the fact that no one seems concerned. You know what the overwhelming sensation was? Well, I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to protect. You listen to this system in Wyoming. 
here are people, and hey, it's logical, someone's not taking proper care of their child in whose eyes? In the eyes of the government. Now, I'm That's not right. making any social commentary here, because you should feed your kid properly. Please don't misunderstand. But now you have the government can track exactly how you're feeding your kids and take those kids away if you don't behave accordingly. And once again, you're into the realm here where the government is making the decision of what's best for your kid. Uh, imagine now the, the agents will come to your door, kick it down, come take your Fruit Loops, give you Wheaties. Imagine how upset you'd have been as a little kid. And so to have the government stepping in and saying this kid needs more bran or something, there, there is, once again, there are situations when this is completely viable and necessary, but there are situations where it can get pretty scary when you it, think of it. It can be overused. What happens, for example, if the government is giving social benefits to someone and they're making them take them by a smart card, and then part of the payment they seen is the C made is to the tithe to their local church. What happens when the government decides that's not acceptable behavior? You see, the question is, it's not the database in itself that is the danger here, although it is the, the technological danger. It's what government has access to that data. And hey, it's not only governments who have access to that data, it's the big business. It's the insurance companies. You file for an insurance claim, they can have everything right sitting right simply there. The point is, they can look at the data and then tell you how to live your life according to it. It becomes a system of control. And as we say, we have been reporting on this week in Bible prophecy lately that since we had the problems in Waco, Texas, you know, the events down there, now you have the European community issuing a list of dangerous cults who should not be allowed to pass through borders. Do you know that they list such things as the assemblies of God, full gospel businessmen? <laughs> this is what a cult is now? Uh, you have USA Today running an article where it's talking about what a cult is, and it's saying it's anyone who would be willing to die for their faith, and anyone who believed they were living in the end times. My goodness, we have just looked at all this evidence to prove we're living in the end times, but now a database can track that you believe that, and by the activities you take on this database, you can be monitored every step of the way. You know, we have to mention a couple of other things right now that I think tie into this. Paul, smart highways, EPIRB, the ability to track people. Say you're a, a recreational boater and you like to go out boating. Here we are in Canada along the Great Lakes here, right along uh, Lake Erie, which is a very rough lake. Um, you get lost out in the middle of the lake, or even more so at sea. You can have a canister now that attaches to your boat. It's called an EPIRB system. And if you get in trouble, you pull the latch on this thing and it begins to emit a signal that is picked up by satellite, and then the satellite can pinpoint exactly where you're located. In an emergency, it sounds like a good thing. But if everyone has a chip, that means if they can monitor the guy in the boat right now, they can monitor anyone with a chip later on down the road. You could track everyone where they're going. Highways, the congestion in Los Angeles, in Toronto, Canada right now, boy, try to drive into Toronto on a weekend. It's absolutely ridiculous. Now they're talking, those of you who are Canadians know Highway 401, it's the major highway going in and through Toronto, Ontario. They're talking about making it a smart highway, a highway that can talk to your car. Uh, so it can, uh, your chip inside the car communicates with the, uh, the chip on the road, and as you're driving by it says, hey, uh, if you're heading in such and such a way, you want, may want to do a detour here. It can give you updates of where you're at all the time, but if it can give you an update of where you're at, it knows where you're at. The, the downside, too, of this thing is that the, the uh, chips in the road are also linked in with the Ontario Provincial Police. A problem. Which means that it also sends in, hey, the guy in this, uh, in this 1972 Biscayne here uh, <laughs> is going 120 kilometers an hour in an 80 kilometer zone. That, that's how we talk here in Canada. Um, in kilometers, right. but you can now get tickets then in the mail and saying you do. our computer found you speeding on such and such a highway. They had them set up for a while that you get a photograph of your car speeding. I don't know what that meant. It could have been parked. It was. It's just a picture. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's what they were doing. I guess just to prove that they they at least they got the right car. That's right. But now you do get your ticket in the mail. Toll, bo toll booths. You can have a chip put in your card. Now remember we we're talking about the contactless cards. You can have a chip put in the windshield of your card that when you scream through the toll booth, 70 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, Your if you're is paid and speed. you get a ticket. That's right, <laughs> so you get it all in the mail. This is the kind of technology that exists today, and it's of great concern to us because the scripture says, speaking of the fa false prophet working under the Antichrist, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark, etc., etc. He causeth all. This system eventually is going to be developed in such a way 
that you have to be within the system to conduct any business. If you're outside of that electronic system, you are locked out of everything. And that's exactly what the scriptures say. It's also interesting, we're talking about the fact that right now we're concerned about uh, the fact that the European community is starting to say, hey, we've got to watch out for people who are members of cults. That's exactly the ones who the world religious system is going to believe believers are in the tribulation period. So the exact ideas are all right there. If you read Revelation chapter 13 very carefully, you'll begin to understand that the mark of the beast is not just simply some economic system. It is instead one of three pillars that the new world order will be built upon in the last days. For along with this global economic system, verses 16 to 18, there will be a global government, verse 7, and a global religious system, verse 8. In fact, these three components work together and overlap with each other in their supporting roles. In that light, then, it should come as absolutely no surprise that the call for this global economic system is inseparable from the call for a new world order. Uh, today, we're moving to an age where it's globalization, or you'll hear words like transnationalization where countries uh, today are gradually giving way to much larger economic blocks. And it's being done again for very good economic reasons. And as we look at the way business is shaping up today, it's really positioning for a one world country, a one world government. Take a look at the conference agenda for the Card Tech Secure Tech Conference in Washington. The theme, Solutions for the Global Frontier, with the pieces of the global puzzle coming together, is about as obvious as you can get. The 1991 conference in Barcelona, Spain, was built around the theme, Borderless Borders, and asked how we can live in the new open world, where people are free to cross borders, as in the new United States of Europe. With a global world in view, they asked, what identification information is necessary and who are the keepers of the database? Will passports be issued by a central bureau or individual nations? Why should debit cards replace cash? Who will make the decisions, government, business, or a worldwide entity? What was their conclusion? The purpose of this conference was to create a dialogue among people who must make decisions about how we are going to live in an open world. The future will be very different from what we have known. We are not yet a global community, but that is clearly the direction in which we are headed. How can the integrity and security of a nation be maintained if people are free to cross from one nation to another? Of course, there must be some constraints, some means of knowing who is wishing to cross, some means of monitoring and or identifying people from various nations. Perhaps the most interesting last year to me was the Skippo travel pass and the way in which in, the, in Holland now, the regular traveler will pay money to buy a smart card and will then voluntarily place his finger within the smart card and use that as a passport replacement product. And talking to the people who run the Skippo Travel Pass, enthusiasm for the product couldn't be stronger. They love it and they can't wait for other people to join the system. Once enrolled, the individual traveling back into the country, first of all through Newark and New York airports, will be able to walk up to an unmanned inspection booth enter their hand, we'll do a hand geometry comparison with data that's contained on the ID card. This very similar to the, the uh, Netherlands system that uses smart card similar application. However, as convenient as all this sounds, Jerry Webster of the INS also said something that we picked up on right away. Given the problems in Waco and the EEC's resulting decision to monitor so-called cults like the Assemblies of God, <laughs> his words were revealing. He spoke of international cooperation among border authorities. But identifying marks, especially some kind of tattoos that identifies somebody with being uh, maybe a member of a particular cult or a particular subversive group that's international, we're certainly talking of sharing at least those images. Well, you know, I can see by the clock now that we really have to summarize this thing and pull it together. And one thing we wanted to do on this video, first of all, was to make this the beginning of a new strategy in the videos that we are preparing through this ministry. And that is to make these more than just an interesting video you watch. This is a witnessing tool. It's to prove the veracity, the accuracy of the Word of God. What is exactly here and how clear it is. And we have that in the prophecy of the mark of the beast. 
you have one of the clearest prophecies in Scripture here. There's no question what's being said. This isn't something that you have to figure out. This isn't the something that somebody says, well, it could be allegorical, it could be symbolical. It says very clearly that everyone will be forced to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead, and they cannot buy or sell a thing unless they do that. Can that system happen or can't it happen in this generation? Um, you take a look back up. Uh, hundred years ago, we used to talk about this a lot on the program, that you couldn't track the buying and selling of everyone. They were trading uh, beaver pelts for eggs right. and so on. Uh, even 25 years ago, you couldn't track it with cash. You couldn't track it today because there's still too many transactions. You couldn't lock somebody out of the system because the fact of the matter is you could still get your hands on cash and conduct your business on the black market. Well, the age is coming when for the first time in history, it will be possible to lock people out of the system. So the mark of the beast is an extremely important prophecy because it does show to us, it is one of the prophecies that shows us that we are indeed the very first generation that could potentially fulfill this prophecy. There are others prophecies like this. We're going to talk about them more and more in upcoming programs. One of them is that except those days be so shortened, all flesh would be destroyed. You couldn't wipe out all flesh in a short period of time 100 years ago, but today with atom bombs, of course, you can do it. For the first time, this generation really fits. This gives us great responsibility with the prophecy of the mark of the beast as well, though, and I want to stress that. The only way that our credibility can be destroyed here, the only way that we can undermine ourselves is if we're going on and on with rumors and unsubstantiated facts in the name of sensationalism. This stuff is sensational enough as it is. If someone tells you the latest story on the mark of the beast, look at the documentation. Make sure the documentation is accurate, and this is what we are striving to do here. We don't want to make up where we may be at and quote sources like, you know, the National Enquirer or something. We want to go right to the source and find out exactly what is taking place, and that's what it's required to do so that we can then use this tool, because I think if you're a believer and you have sat and watched this video, you realize how powerful a presentation the Mark of the Beast is. And if you're an unbeliever, you have to be at least a little bit amazed at how accurate the Bible is. You know, you mentioned the, the sensationalism, and we have talked before about the stories that used to go around about the Mark of the Beast, sure. about the town in Sweden, the entire uh, town had been forced to receive some kind of a mark or they couldn't buy or sell. There were the stories about social security checks uh, in the United States that were accidentally issued, that people s turned them over and it said, you can't cash this without a mark in your right hand or forehead. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever got a copy of one. Nobody ever photocopied one. I think when you're talking and when you're witnessing about the prophecy of the mark of the beast, steer clear of that stuff, because that is the stuff there's no proof. It's all stuff that's just made up. It's rumors. It's stories. It's and not it, accurate. It's nonsense. And so what you do is you undermine yourself. There is plenty of documented stuff, documented information, and proof of this stuff that you don't have to reach for that stuff when you're talking to your friends. Please think of what Paul is saying here. This videotape is a perfect example. You have seen interviews with the top guys who are sitting there demonstrating the equipment and explaining their vision to you. You can't get it more firsthand than that. That's exactly right. The other, one other thing I'd like to say just very quickly, Often when we're uh, out at conferences and that kind of thing and we're running into people and we start talking about the mark of the beast, a lot of people are coming up and saying, well, what do I do when, uh, when they come up and try and make me take this mark? The important thing to know is that comes after the rapture, the, right. the people receiving the mark of the beast. This is not for, for the believer. This is for unbelievers who remain after the rapture. And of course, the key thing to do here is to become a member of the cashless society. We just got there a little bit early, <laughs> I think, somehow. <laughs> and hey, send your money into your favorite Christian ministry and help them to do the outreach <laughs> in the days ahead. But we say all that to say, this is not, we're not trying to sell you economic news here. We're just saying, here's the technology of what will take place during the tribulation period, the rapture does come first. So your goal is not to make your economic plan. Your goal is to get your heart right with the Lord now because the rapture, that moment when the Lord catches his believers to be in his presence forever, catches us up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, that's the next event on the calendar. That's the one you want to be preparing for. This is a perfect time to make another point as well. What is the mark of the beast? People say, you know, it's interesting, I bought your video on the Mark of the Beast with my Visa card, you know, and, and they think that there's a little bit of a, uh, a mixed message there, but no, uh, I'm not doing a plug for Visa or MasterCard here, but the fact of the matter is that isn't the Mark of the Beast. The Mark of the Beast is not an economic decision that people will make. This is not about economics. I want to take a look here at Revelation chapter uh, 14, beginning at verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying, 
with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. God is not going to pour out his wrath without mixture because someone chose the wrong credit card. He is not going to pour out his wrath because of an economic decision we have made. But you can see here that the mark of the beast is very clearly tied in with a worshiping of the Antichrist. Look, I'm going to close on this note. How in the world is the Antichrist going to get people to accept the number 666? Everybody in the world knows that that's an evil number. They've seen the Omen movies. They've seen, you know, the every <laughs> Rock and roll thing. albums. Rock and roll albums. Everyone knows what 666 is. You'd think if the devil had any brain at all, he'd change it to 665. How is he going to get the world to take this number that everybody knows is the devil's number? Maybe it's a slight twisting of the tables. This is just a theory now. But perhaps he will rise up and say, we have been guilty of this outmoded thinking, this superstition for so long that there's some God out there. When we're just here to take care of ourselves, we're here to build our own kingdom. Life is only what we make it. And it's this kind of religious narrowness, this kind of religious idealism that has stopped world peace. And now that these people have vanished out into the twilight zone here, the bad people are gone out of our way. Just to show that we're not bound by this old thinking anymore, Let's use the number 666 just to show that we've come of age and we're not scared of some devil's mark. Seems to be, me to be the only logical way that it can come about. And if you read Revelation 13, the chapters we're talking about, what does it tell us about the rise of the Antichrist? A look more stout than his fellows. A mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, speaking great words against the Most High. He shall make war with the saints and he shall overcome them. This can't be the church. The church has to be gone in the rapture because the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. But there'll be believers who realize that Jesus is the Messiah during the tribulation period. This is a religious decision. The mark of the beast ties into the world religion more than it does to a world economic system because it's all tied into who will you bow your knee before? What kingdom are you going to follow and choose? Doing a video like this is very exciting for us, that God has allowed us the opportunity in our ministry. We, we could never have dreamed that this was true. Patty and I were talking about this the other evening that God would allow us to send camera crews to Washington to document this kind of thing, to interview various people from government agencies. The whole point is, all the documentation is laid out. What are you going to do with it? You know, you read in the book of Isaiah, it's such powerful passages where the Lord talks continually saying, I am God and there is none like me. I declare the things from the beginning to the things that are not yet done. I'll tell you the future. None of the other so-called gods in the world today can do that. They don't even attempt to do it. But God lays it out that we can know that God is in control. We can know that our hope is not in this world. We can know that we have a hope that is eternal and secure and in this generation particularly, when with all the confusing religious messages out there, God's prophetic word is coming into light right now. And if God can control the entire history and tell us 2,000 years ago, through the Apostle John, a guy sitting in a toga on an island somewhere, what we've just read about, what we've just seen this whole video about, that it would come to pass 2,000 years into the future, that is a message that God is sending to you, that he is in control. And if he can control the things of the world, then he can meet the needs you have in your life too. If you're a believer, it's time to get serious. Jesus is coming soon. If you're not a believer, you don't want to wait a second longer. You don't want to do it out of fear, but to serve this God who came and gave himself for you and told you what the future would hold, but then told you in face of all of these things, let not your heart be troubled. What a beautiful message. That's the message of the gospel, that you can have the peace of Christ in your heart. It's not a complicated process to ask the Lord to come into our heart. The only complicated process is you coming to terms in your heart and saying, yes, I'm ready to turn over the reins of this life to Christ. It's a decision only you can make. God bless you. And if the Lord doesn't come back first, we'll see you again next time. Stay tuned for more This Week in Bible Prophecy Ministry Tools. In our never-ending mission to make This Week in Bible Prophecy even better, we asked some of our faithful viewers for some advice. I really enjoy the program. 
I, I wish that there were a way for me to get more information on some of the items presented uh, for, for us to go a little more in depth. The program goes by so quickly. There's so much content and it's, it's coming at you just uh, zoom, zoom, zoom and uh, there's only so much you can retain. In the program they give you so much and you, there's just not time enough to absorb it all. We try to approach this problem a number of different ways. Yes, could you tell me the price of another half hour of airtime, please? Hello? Hello, hello? Hi, now, last week we began a special series where we in the aired Church of for Jesus you Christ. portions out of our... Finally, we came up with an idea that worked. This week in Bible Prophecy Magazine, if you're serious about Bible prophecy, then you won't want to be without this colorful new magazine. Every month, a brand new issue, always jam-packed with all the fascinating news from the world of Bible prophecy. It's like having a book on prophecy that never ends. Every time you finish one exciting chapter, a new one is delivered to your door, always fascinating and never out of date. From the mark of the beast to the new world order, and from Ezekiel's visions to the beast of Revelation, this colorful new magazine is sure to become must-reading for every serious student of Bible prophecy. And for a limited time, we have a very special offer. We've had hundreds of calls and letters from our viewers asking about the song that we play at the end of the program. The song is called The Altar, and that beautiful voice belongs to Valerie Holmes. Now you can have a professionally mastered audio cassette of Valerie's best love songs with your subscription to This Week in Bible Prophecy magazine. And because we're so sure that you'll love This Week in Bible Prophecy magazine, we're backing it with a full, no questions asked, money back guarantee. There is another gospel in the land. A gospel that openly proclaims its hatred of Christians. A gospel so deceptive that Jesus warned of its coming. A gospel so deadly it can kill the soul. Introducing, deceiving and being deceived, exposing the new age lie. In this powerful new age video, Peter and Paul Lalonde take you on a fascinating and vital journey behind the scenes of America's fastest growing phenomenon, the new age movement. You'll see how Bill Clinton is using his presidential powers to further the causes of globalism. You'll even see him deliberately misquote the Bible to support his humanistic ideas. You'll learn how new age and occult techniques are being taught to our children in public school classrooms. You'll be amazed as you hear new age leaders actually calling for the extermination of Christians. Never before has so much vital information on the new age being packed into one video. But as always, Peter and Paul present it in a clear way that is easy for both Christians and unbelievers to follow and understand. Much of this video has been deemed too hot for TV as it probes into the secret societies that are working behind the scenes to plan your future. You'll finally get a chance to look at the things the media just won't tell you. Remember the outcry when it was found out that Nancy Reagan consulted an astrologer to set the president's schedule? Page one news. Now Hillary Clinton claims to be talking to the ghost of Eleanor Roosevelt and nobody seems to care. Don't wait another minute to find out the truth about Al Gore's call to turn away from Christianity and embrace the more important earth-based religions. A former vice presidential nominee's call for the elimination of Christianity. David Koresh and the media's treatment of this new age imposter. We talked about all the things that we wanted to do, and this video wasn't even in our plan to do, but more material kept coming and coming and coming, and we agreed we need to get this material out today. As a special bonus to help you in your quest to win souls, we have included a handy pocket-sized reference card to carry with you everywhere you go. It contains all of the important scripture references that you will need when you are witnessing to unbelievers about the New Age movement. To order any of the preceding This Week in Bible Prophecy products, simply have your credit card ready and call toll-free 1-800-PROPHECY. If at any time you are not 100% satisfied, return the package for a full refund. To order, the number again is 1-800-PROPHECY. Or if you prefer to order by mail, send check or money order to This Week in Bible Prophecy, P.O. Box 5091, Burlington, Ontario, L7R 4M2, or P.O. Box 1440, Niagara Falls, New York, 
14302. And please make all checks payable to This Week in Bible Prophecy. For product price and information, call toll-free 1-800-PROPHECY.